Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, coming at you for another one of our live programs on the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's Facebook page. I am joined today by historian, blogger, author, uh, journalist, jack of all trades, John Banks. How are you doing today? Jake, I'm doing great here on a really beautiful day in Nashville, Tennessee. Couldn't be better. Excellent. How is how are things down there in Tennessee? Things are going great, Jake. We recently moved into a new house, which we're attempting to get up the snuff. And I haven't snuck my uh, hundred pound artillery shell into my new relic room, but uh, past Mrs. Banks, but I'm hopeful of doing that pretty soon. So we're going to cross our fingers that she's not watching this Facebook live feed. I hope not. <laughs> That will be an interesting day when that finally happens, and I'm kind of sort of looking forward to that, uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, excellent. I might not, might not be doing any more Facebook Live after. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we got you. We got you before that happens, so we're we're yes, lucky. There. That's that's tremendous. That's tremendous. Uh, so thanks for joining us today, John. Uh, we have a bit of a brief introduction that for those of you who are tuning in. Uh, live with us. Um, if you've watched one of our videos before, you'll be familiar with this. Uh, but we've been doing these programs here on our Facebook page and over on YouTube, uh, dating back to March since the pandemic began. And uh, we've been doing online programming ever since. Uh, we've had all kinds of historians and authors and museum professionals, uh, doctors, uh, distillers, all kinds of folks on and having conversations about Civil War medicine, about medical history, and how it relates to today. Uh, the National Museum of Civil War Medicine is located in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, we have two additional sites, uh, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, DC, which is where I am right now, uh, and the Pry House Field Hospital Museum on Antietam National Battlefield. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today is Antietam. So we do, as an institution, have that connection uh, to the hospital sites at Antietam Battlefield. Uh, part of our mission is, of course, to talk about the medical story of the Civil War, uh, but it's also to draw the connections between the past and the present. Uh, this is an idea that we have called hope through history, that if by studying the past, uh, we can see lessons for us uh, today. And this has been, of course, very much connected with the pandemic that's going on. We can see a lot of connections uh, back from the Civil War experiences of medical professionals and the wounded and the sick soldiers of the Civil War uh, to the situation that we are facing today with the worst public health crisis in a century. So that's what a lot of these programs have really been doing is drawing these connections. And, and many times, even when we're just talking about the Civil War experience, you'll be able to see those parallels yourself. Now, if you've been enjoying these programs, we do provide them for free here on our Facebook page and YouTube. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying them. If you have, you can help us out. You can help us out by going up and pressing that like button up there at the top of the screen uh, or over to the right or left, wherever you may be uh, finding us on, on the Facebook stream. Uh, you can also help us by commenting. Let us know where you're watching from. It's always amazing to see uh, where we have folks tuning in from. We've got folks right now watching from Ohio and Connecticut, Woodbridge, Virginia, New Jersey, Oregon, Georgia, folks from all over the country. In many cases, we have folks watching from all over the world as well on many of these streams. Uh, if you want to take your support to the next level, you can do that by becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So if you've enjoyed these programs, you find them worthwhile, uh, you can support us. You can directly support these streams and you also get lots of cool perks like free um, admission to all three of our sites. Uh, you get museum publications, get cool perks like that, and you get the knowledge that you've been supporting uh, conversations and history like this. Um, we need this history because it does, like I said before, provide lots of lessons for us in our current situation. So you'll be able to find a link to that, our membership uh, page on our website in the comments section in just a little bit. So enough from me. Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got interested in the story of, of the Antietam battlefield specifically? Well, Jay, first of all, thanks for having me here. This is a great thrill for me and and uh, I'm a big fan of what uh, you do uh, and what the uh, museum does having met you for the first time several years ago at the Pry House in Antietam uh, I really appreciate what you do 
Uh, I'm a longtime journalist, uh, worked for the Dallas Morning News and ESPN for many years. Uh, I write for Civil War Times and America's Civil War. I have a column in Civil War Times called Rambling, in which I try to uh, kind of take a different approach and, and go to the nooks and crannies of various Civil War sites. Regarding Antietam, uh, my first job out of college, uh, I'm not going to tell you the year because it'll date me. It was many moons ago, Jake. Uh, I worked at the, I was sports editor at the uh, Martinsburg Evening Journal in West Virginia, which was about 10 miles or so, 10, 12 miles from the battlefield, and uh, made frequent visits over to the battlefield, got to know, you know, a lot of people there, uh, in particular, uh, knew the family uh, who back in the day owned the, the, Miller, the Miller farm. Uh, there was a color family and I ended up, uh, you know, I was sports editor for the paper in Martinsburg, but before I became sports editor, I, I wrote news also. And I ended up doing a story on, uh, you know, what that family found in the, in the years that they had been farming the battlefield there. And again, this was before it became park service property. And when I drove up to the, the Miller farmhouse that day, they had a big, huge table right on their, in their driveway. And it was full of uh, bullets and, uh, you know, gun parts and uh, cannon artillery shell fragments. And man, I just became fascinated with that stuff. And uh, they told me some really terrific stories. So that kind of lit my fire, so to speak, for Antietam. And since then, even when we lived in Texas and uh, when I worked for ESPN in Connecticut, always found time to go back to the battlefield. And, and over the years, I've just uh, got to know a lot more people. And, and every time I go there, I, I learn something new. So. It's a really, it's a really incredible place uh, when you go, when you go to Antietam specifically, it's just, uh, you, you can definitely, it has a presence, doesn't it? It, it has a, has a, a pull to it. You feel drawn to that battlefield in particular. It's a, it's a beautiful place. Um, you know, the beautiful countryside, the mountains in the distance, uh, the valley of Antietam Creek. Uh, and it, it just, it, it has that kind of a draw to it. You feel that presence of, you know, not only natural beauty, but of course of, you know, the sense of, of dramatic events and things that have happened there. Exactly. And, and what I always say, like people who are unfamiliar with the battlefield, I always say that if a soldier went back to Antietam, a Civil War soldier, went back to Antietam today, I mean, you could merely take away the monuments on the battlefield. And it looks pretty much like it did in 1862. And, and the only other battlefield that I could liken it to, a couple of weeks ago, I was at Perryville in Kentucky. And I don't know if you've been there before, but Perryville is just amazing. And, and you know, Antietam and Perryville are, are some of the few battlefields that you can go to and, and think, boy, this is, this is 1862. I haven't gotten the chance to to get there, but I know you wrote about this uh, this visit on your on your blog, um, yes. and uh, it looks fantastic. I, I can't wait to get to, to to Perryville. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And thanks for mentioning my blog. <laughs> I probably should have mentioned that in the intro. I've been blogging <laughs> for a long time, and uh, uh, hopefully, I'm much better than I was <laughs> back in 2008 or 2007 or whatever the heck I started. I did it as a lark. Uh, because back then it was like, wow, wow, I can put something on the internet. And it grew into a monster, uh, a good yeah. monster. Yeah. So, it's, anyway. it's it's a it's an incredible uh, it's an incredible resource. If you're at all interested in in the Antietam battlefield or really just in the Civil War in general, I highly recommend you check out um, John's blog. I'm going to put the link uh, to the blog into the comment section here in in just a bit. Um, and that really is is why we we brought you on today. And you've been kind of on my on my bucket list uh, of of folks to to bring on to the the digital programs here, and hopefully at some point in the future uh, an actual program at one of our sites as well. Um, but it's because you tell some really fascinating 
Antietam stories, uh, not just about, of course, medicine, which is what we do here at the museum, um, but all different sorts of stories from the battlefield, uh, human interest stories. I think you bring that kind of journalistic approach uh, to these stories to be able to find these incredible sources and to be able to make these stories come to life. And there are a few of these stories of these Antietam hospitals that I know have, I've used in my research. I, I know I've sent to people and shared, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to have you on here to be able to talk about some of those stories. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And, and one thing I wanted to make clear is like, I am not a right flank, left flank person. I'm geographically challenged at, you know, I go for a walk in our new neighborhood here and I immediately get lost. And I'm absolutely uh, passionate about telling the human interest stories. And they're, you know, like I, like I mentioned earlier, every time I go there, uh, I go there with the intention of hopefully uh, coming up with another story. And there are just so many great human interest stories. And the Antietam Hospital, when you uh, sent me a, a note regarding, hey, I think this would be a good topic, that immediately, I was like, oh my gosh, there are a ton of great stories surrounding uh, the many hospitals that were uh, on the battlefield or, or in the surrounding area. There's a lot of really terrific stories there, so. Excellent, so uh, with that, uh, you, you, ready to, you ready to jump in? Yeah, I think so. And what I'm gonna do, Jake, is I'm kinda gonna serve as a little tour guide to some of the uh, eight sites that I think the, the, uh, the viewers on Facebook Live would find compelling. And again, when I go to the battlefield, um, you know, the monuments are, 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 are neat to look at and the terrain and all that type of stuff. But every time I see a, an old house or, an, or, a, or a barn, an old barn that dates to the war, uh, it was probably used as a, as a hospital or, or an aid station. And I figured uh, since we're, uh, we'll see if we can, there we go. Uh, are the images showing up there, Jake? Yep, you're looking good. Awesome. Um, yeah, I'm gonna kind of take you through eight sites that I think are pretty important. And what you're seeing here is a, uh, is a wartime image taken in 1862 by Alexander Gardner. And Jake, I'm gonna get up and close this door for a second, apology. Sorry about that. We have some work <laughs> being done in the neighborhood. But anyway, this image was taken at the uh, Stephen Grove Farm, which is on uh, the Shepherdstown Pike. And a lot of people, when they go to Antietam, again, will, will go to the visitor center and they'll, they'll drive around the battlefield. Um, they may not get out of their cars, which you absolutely have to, it's a great walking battlefield. And they may not see some of these places that I'm gonna talk about now, but the Stephen Grove Farm, uh, known as Mount, uh, the house is known as Mount Airy, um, was a hugely significant uh, uh, site just outside of Sharpsburg. Again, it's on the, the Shepherdstown Pike leading to Shepherdsburg, Virginia, which is now West Virginia. And what's significant about this beyond the photo that Alexander Gardner took in early October, 1862, is that Lincoln, when he visited this place, it was a hospital not only for Union soldiers at the time, but it also was a hospital for Confederate soldiers. And thankfully for us, a reporter was uh, part of Lincoln's visit. I believe he was for uh, working for a Cincinnati newspaper. And Lincoln goes into this uh, the the Stephen Grove Farm, uh, and I'm going to try to. <laughs> click through, there it is right there. That's a present day image of the Stephen Grove farm. As uh, the day that Lincoln goes in here, it's filled with Confederate and Union wounded. And it was an amazing scene, a very emotional scene. And I'm gonna read just a, a short account here uh, from the Cincinnati reporter about what Lincoln found there. And he wrote, Mr. Lincoln, uh, after looking inside, remarked to the wounded Confederates that, that if they had no objection, he would be pleased to take them by the hand. He said the solemn obligations which we owe to our country and posterity 
compel the prosecution of this war. And it followed that many were enemies through uncontrollable circumstances. And he bore them no malice and could take them by the hand with sympathy and good feeling. After a short silence, the Confederates came forward and each silently but fervently shook the hand of the president. Mr. Lincoln and General McClellan then walked forward by the side of those that were wounded too severely to be able to arise and bid them be of good cheer, assuring them that every possible care should be bestowed upon them to ameliorate their condition. It was a moving scene and there was not a dry eye in the building. Just a really incredible scene that took place there. And it should be noted, Jake, that this is private property. You should not trespass. And you can see this from the, the, the roadside as you go to towards Shepherdstown on the left side of the Shepherdstown Pike. Here's another image that I took a couple of years ago. And I often wonder <laughs> when I was there, I kept staring at the steps going, oh my gosh, here's where you know, the 16th president of the United States walked through this door to uh, visit with uh, uni uh, wounded from both sides. It's really an amazing place. And in the field surrounding this house, the, uh, I believe it's the Union Fifth Corps uh, camped in the aftermath of uh, the Battle of Antietam and of course the Battle of Shepherdstown that took place uh, a couple days after Antietam. It's really a, an incredible uh, sight and, and a real treat to be able to see that place up close uh, a couple years ago. All right, we'll go to stop number two as I put my, my tour guide hat on. And many people who, uh, Jake, who visit Antietam again, will, will go to the battlefield, uh, ride on the tour route, and they won't realize that there's some incredible uh, Antietam history that's uh, right on Main Street in Sharpsburg. And what you're looking at is the, the wartime German Reformed Church. It's a Lutheran church. Uh, it was one of uh, three churches, I believe, that were in Sharpsburg in 1862. And this place to me is really special. And when I lived in Connecticut, um, you know, I knew nothing about, uh, almost nothing about Connecticut Civil War history. Uh, I really dived into uh, uh, the service of Connecticut soldiers at the Battle of Antietam. And there were three regiments who, that, that fought at, three Connecticut regiments that fought at Antietam. It was the 8th Connecticut, the 14th Connecticut, and the 16th Connecticut. Uh, the 14th and 16th, this was their first battle of the war. The 8th Connecticut, it, uh, it was a veteran regiment. This became, the German Reformed Church became uh, a hospital uh, for the 9th Corps. And so many unbelievable stories took place here. And, and a couple of years ago, it was really neat for me. I gave a uh, a talk in Sharpsburg in this church where, which was a hospital during the war. Um, and there, uh, among the stories that I wanted to tell you is uh, the story of this young man right here. His name, this was uh, George Chamberlain. He was about 19, I believe, when he enlisted. He was from Middletown, Connecticut. He was in the 16th Connecticut. He was wounded in, uh, the 40 acre cornfield. And if you've been to Antietam before and you haven't walked out into the 40 acre cornfield, please do. Um, George was wounded in the knee uh, uh, in the 40 acre cornfield. He was taken to the German Reformed Church Hospital where he uh, was treated. He had a bullet behind his knee and the surgeon's report, which you uh, see a portion of it below there, uh, I have a copy of the, the, uh, the case book from, from many of the cases that, the, that were handled at the German Reformed Church. Uh, the surgeon noted that uh, the mini ball lodged uh, behind his left knee, and apparently he couldn't take it out for quite some time. 
or it wasn't taken out for quite some time. So you can only imagine the pain that George was in as he was at the German Reformed Church Hospital. Uh, there's a pretty gruesome account of the, uh, the surgeon draining pus from the wound. It, it was really a, a pretty tragic story. He ends up surviving his bullet wound. He ends up going back to Connecticut. Uh, he's seen on crutches around town. He was in constant pain. Uh, he finally ends up going out to Ohio for, for treatment at a, uh, uh, at a spa or whatever in Ohio. And he writes back to his, uh, his mother, who was very obviously very concerned about him. Uh, he wrote this to his mother, I believe this was in 1864, late winter, uh, regarding the physician that was treating him. He goes, I think he is the nearest right of any physician that I've employed. He says also that from my throat to my stomach, is one complete mass of ulcers and that it is like raw meat. I'm convinced that the greatest trouble is in my stomach. I am greatly troubled to keep food down at all. Uh, he, is, he was unable to work. Uh, he uh, uh, was getting treated in Ohio. Anyway, George Chamberlain was one of those soldiers who he didn't die until 1865, but the cause of death was, was his uh, his wound three years earlier uh, at Antietam, a, a very tragic story. Um, another soldier who, uh, from the 16th Connecticut, who was treated at the German Reformed Church Hospital as a young man named uh, James Brooks. And Jake, when, when I lived in Connecticut uh, in my spare time, I, I was a little odd back in the day. I'm still a little odd sometimes, but on weekends or, or, or my off time, I love to go visit uh, cemeteries. And James Brooks, uh, I don't know if his body was actually, he was a private in the 16th Connecticut. He was, I believe, 18 years old. Uh, I found his marker in, I believe this is in Willington, Connecticut, which is in the northwestern part of the state. I think I have that right. And this is his marker there uh, in uh, Connecticut. He ended up dying from his wounds and in Tiedem at the German Reformed Church Hospital. And in the case book, uh, the surgeon's case book, it's just incredible to read the account of the treatment. And the surgeon goes, regarding James, he goes, he has six wounds. The boy is emaciated, but has an appetite and there is hope. And then on the evening of October 7th, 1862, he writes, doing pretty well considering multiplicity of wounds. On the morning of October 9th, he goes, holding his own remarkably. Apparently they were thinking, the surgeon thought that he may somehow survive these six wounds that uh, he received in the 40 acre cornfield in Antietam. On October 11th, the surgeon writes, failing rapidly and might die soon. October 11th, 3 p.m., just died. And again, this was an 18-year-old kid uh, from Connecticut, his first battle of the Civil War. Uh, he ends up dying at the German uh, Reformed Church Hospital. Here's another story from that hospital, Jake, that is uh, particularly compelling to me. Um, one of the soldiers who was being treated there, his name was... Uh, uh, John Loveland, uh, he was, uh, I believe he was a barber from Hartford, and he, he too was in the, the 16th Connecticut. He's wounded in the 40-acre cornfield, um, ends up being taken to uh, the German Reformed Church. One of his friends ends up being uh, uh, asked to, to help serve with, uh, help treat, help handle the wounded uh, in the German Reformed Church, his name was Henry Tracy. And one night, uh, Henry's going, making his rounds in the hospital, aiding the wounded, and he sees James, uh, John Loveland kind of thrashing about. What happened was the vein in his leg, he was shot in the leg, I believe, ended up bursting, and he took his hand to try to, held, held his hand over the, the wound in his leg, 
uh, until John died. Uh, pretty amazing uh, scene in that hospital. And many of his stories played out in this pretty nondescript building in, in uh, right on Main Street in Sharpsburg that many people pass it and, and have no idea that, hey, oh my gosh, this is what happened. They have no idea what happened there. And uh, the next time you go to Sharpsburg, you'll also notice if you walk up to the church or if you, you, you know, get a chance to go inside, there are beautiful windows in the front there, Jake, that were donated by veterans of the 16th Connecticut. They're really amazing, particularly to see from the inside when the, when the sunlight streams from the outside. It's, they're very beautiful. Before we, before we switch away from the, uh, from the German Reformed Hospital here, we have a, a question from, from Carolyn Ivanoff, who has said uh, yes. that she, she says hello. Um, yes, I know Carolyn. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and for all of you out there watching, hope you're enjoying the presentation so far. If you do have any questions or comments, I know I've, I saw another one here from John Folks that we'll get to uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, please feel free to add those to the comment section. We'll, we'll address those um, as, as we're uh, chatting today. Um, but Carolyn asks, uh, how can we access the German Reformed Hospital casebook? Is that possible? The casebook, um, it's in the National Archives. Um, I have a copy of it that I made that are, are stored away in some boxes that we have in my our new house here. I'd be happy to send Carolyn a copy of that. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read because it's in the doctors, as we all know, doctors, at least in the old days, had, <laughs> had, had very illegible writing. Uh, and I think uh, I'll have to look, but I think I have transcribed the whole the entire thing. So I will look around and I'd be happy to share that. Excellent, thank you, John. You bet. Is there another question, Jake, or? Uh, we'll, we'll, get to, uh, we'll get to John uh, Folks um, has a question here. We'll, we'll, we'll address that one at the, at the conclusion of the program. Uh, just a program note as well. Uh, these videos are accessible after the fact. So we're live right now, which is great. We really appreciate all 67 of you watching at the moment. Um, and uh, thank you all for your comments and, and saying hello. We appreciate that. Uh, this program will be accessible uh, in the uh, days, weeks, months, and, and years in the, into the future. So you'll be able to go back and watch these uh, if you don't get to watch the entire program with, live with us today. But John, we'll get to your, your uh, John folks, we'll get to your question at the, uh, at the conclusion of the program. Uh, John, I'll turn it back over to you with the continue on with the presentation. Excellent. And Jake, one of the things that, that, that I acquired uh, several years ago, I have a, a modest Civil War collection, is a, uh, this is the envelope that was sent to uh, 16th Connecticut Private Horace Lay. Sadly, I do not have the contents of that envelope, uh, which would be really neat to have. And as you can see, the, the postmark is, I believe, November 8, 1862. So Horace was in the German Reformed Church Hospital for uh, almost two months after the Battle of Antietam. He ended up dying there in November, I believe, November 16, 1862. That's kind of a, a, a neat thing to see. And you can see the, obviously, the period stamp in the upper uh, left-hand corner there. Okay. Um, another one of my favorite places, Jake, at Antietam is the uh, John Otto Farmhouse. And what you're looking at here is an image from a, a Pennsylvania regimental history. I, uh, I'm not, I forget which one it is, but this is an image that shows you the Otto farmhouse, which still exists. You can still see that uh, on the battlefield. It's on Burnside Bridge Road. And many of the outbuildings behind and to the side uh, of the farmhouse, they do not exist. Uh, you can see the uh, the ruins of the Pennsylvania style bank barn, which is roughly 120 uh, yards behind the house. And the reason I'm showing you this is one of the, one of my favorite stories, there's the, the ruins of the, uh, the Pennsylvania style bank barn. Um, one of my favorite stories is, is this one about uh, Henry Evans. He was a private in the uh, 16th Connecticut, one of my favorite regiments. Uh, because of my, you know, nine or 10 years living in Connecticut. Henry was uh, wounded in the 40-acre cornfield 
And immediately uh, he lay in that cornfield for a day and a half. That was no man's land after the battle. And the first place that he was taken, Jake, was the uh, Otto Farmhouse for treatment. It was an aid station after the battle. Uh, many soldiers were taken there. Uh, Henry was a, uh, Henry Adams, I'm sorry, not, uh, not Evans. Henry uh, was taken there uh, before he was uh, uh, along to another hospital, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and he was amazed that he, that he survived uh, the Battle of Antietam. And what I did often, Jake, when I lived in Connecticut is I would make a trip down to the Connecticut State Archives and there's a collection there called the George Whitney Collection that George Whitney was a soldier in the 16th Connecticut and he compiled some amazing biographies of, uh, his aim was to uh, compile biographies of everybody who served in the 16th Connecticut, roughly uh, maybe a little more than a thousand biographies. And I used to go down to the state archives and, and go through that box of material, just a trove of tremendous stuff. And I found the file on Henry Adams. It was really amazing. Uh, Henry is in the middle of this photo right here. He's holding the cane. He has the white, the white mustache right here. He was wounded in the leg at Antietam. Uh, this image was taken September 17, 1921. Henry looks kind of grumpy. Uh, there's a reason for his grumpiness, Jake. I mean, he was still troubled by that wound that he had in Antietam. And what was amazing in looking through the, uh, the information in his file is that I found a letter that he wrote post-war. And I'm, I'm just reading it, and they're like, these words just stood out when I read it. And, and the letter was from the early 20th century, I believe. He said, why did I not die? He amazingly, he couldn't believe that he survived the Battle of Antietam. Uh, many of his comrades, this was their first battle of the Civil War, didn't survive this battle. He was, he was simply amazed. He was eventually taken to another hospital there, the uh, Crystal Spring or Big Locust, Locust uh, Farm Hospital. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but when he finally, his mother ended up coming down to, uh, from Connecticut to, to see him, help nurse him, uh, in the months after, uh, uh, Antietam, he ends up getting discharged from the army on April 1st, 1863. And his comment then was, was no April full day to me. My mother and her crippled boy on crutches started homeward bound. I received my discharge papers at Hagerstown, Maryland, and my full pay for doing nothing except to be maimed for life and to draw a U.S. pension. And wow. there are so many stories like that, Jake. That's like, like every time I go there, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to find? What great story am I going to find here? And, and you do that by talking to people and, and, and digging. And there are many, many ways to do digging. Here's the, uh, uh, here Jake is the, is the 40 acre cornfield. Uh, and again, for you uh, folks who have either not been to Antietam or have been there and not gotten out of, and, and walked the ground, walk the final attack trail, go see the 40 acre cornfield. It's an amazing place, uh, uh, amazing piece of terrain, uh, rolling terrain. Uh, on the Antietam battlefield. It's very, very beautiful too. Okay, um, this is another one of my favorite places. This is a, uh, let me emphasize, a private residence. You should not trespass. This is the uh, Crystal Spring Farm or Big Locust Farm. It went by uh, different names. Uh, this was one of two tent hospitals at, the, uh, at Antietam mainly, I believe, a, a Ninth Corps hospital, uh, men in, uh, wounded in Burnside's, uh, uh, who served under Burnside. Uh, this was so many tragedies played out uh, on this farm, Jake, and uh, uh, it's really quite a, quite a 
quite a place. And it, it by the way, if you want to go past this, you uh, get on Geating Road uh, in uh, Katiesville, and you, you can go past it. There is a uh, Save Historic Antietam Foundation marker out front that denotes this as a Civil War hospital. Again, this is this is private property. Do not trespass. Here's what it looked like, I believe, in the uh, early 20th century. And uh, again, many, many tragedies played out here. Among them uh, was the story of this man. This is Colonel Hiram Appleman, who was a uh, officer in the 8th Connecticut. And his story, Jake, is particularly interesting because uh, the 8th Connecticut swept uh, uh, through the 40 acre cornfield and fought up near Harper's Ferry Road. Uh, they eventually were, uh, uh, this is late, late in the afternoon of September 17th, 1862. They're eventually pushed back. Uh, Appleman again was an officer in that regiment. He probably was shot uh, perhaps deliberately by one of his own men. Uh, he was shot in the leg. And uh, I have an account of a, another soldier in the 8th Connecticut who talks very disparagingly, Jake, about uh, Colonel Appleman. Apparently, they had a disagreement in the weeks leading up to the Battle of Antietam. Again, the 8th Connecticut was a, a veteran regiment. Uh, uh, Hiram ends up surviving his wound. Uh, his brother goes down to Antietam to see him and is just aghast by what he looked like, he was emaciated. Uh, I believe he was shot uh, in the leg. He ends up surviving the battle, goes back home, uh, and he dies, uh, uh, I believe, shortly after the war. Um, and he was from, uh, I believe, Mystic, Connecticut in the southern part of the state. Okay, here's another one uh, of my uh, favorite places, and again, uh, I want to emphasize that this is private property in Antietam. You should not trespass. Um, what you're looking at here is the Henry Rohrbach farmhouse, and which is, uh, if you go to uh, if you go to Antietam, many folks, Jake, go to uh, the iconic Burnside Bridge. Uh, uh, this is well. This is beyond Burnside Bridge on the. Uh, uh, on the opposite side of, of where the Georgians were up on the bluff. Uh, it was a staging area for uh, the Ninth Corps. And during and after the battle, this is one of the important hospital sites at Antietam. Um, this is where uh, Union General Isaac Rodman, after he was wounded, uh, was taken here. And he ended up dying here, I believe in October, 1862, a couple weeks after the battle. And there's an account, Jake, of uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, family friends, I believe, who uh, uh, the Rohrbachs, uh, you know, because their 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 house was being house and barn were being used as a hospital. There was wounded inside this house. Among them, uh, General uh, General Rod, Union General Rodman, and his wound was smelled so bad that the family had to eat outside the house. I mean, it's just an awful, horrible scene. Um, there's also, uh, there's a tremendous barn that's still on the property. And you can see in the, uh, in the top of the brickwork, it says HR for Henry Rohrbach. It's an amazing, I just love this barn. It's such a cool, cool barn to look at. Uh, but when I went there briefly several years ago, you have to remember that in September 17th, 1862, and, and through early October, this was a hospital. And the scenes there were pretty, pretty stark as uh, many Union soldiers were treated, were, had amputations performed here. Uh, many soldiers died there, including uh, this gentleman. This is. Uh, 16th Connecticut Captain Frederick Barber, who uh, was shot in the leg in Otto's, and, and I'm sorry, in the 40 acre cornfield. He had a very gruesome operation called a resection. I am not a doctor, but uh, what, from what I understand, it's a, I think it's essentially a shortening, uh, his 
bone was the bone was sawed and shortened and maybe Jake, you know a little bit more about it. It's a gruesome operation. Yeah, it's uh, it's you you described it pretty well there. It's removing the damaged section of uh, of bone uh, from a, from an injury um, that broke that bone or shattered it, which was oftentimes the result of being struck by small arms fire during the war, the mini ball in particular. Um, the photographs of, of the, the aftermath of those operations are, are quite gruesome. Um, bone, arms, legs bent in odd directions, shortened bones. It's uh, particularly gruesome, ultimately proved to be less successful uh, medically uh, in many cases than did uh, amputations during the war. Amputations proved to be more successful in terms of saving lives. Um, so the idea that uh, you, know, you could save the limb, but that wouldn't always turn out so well. Well, Captain Barber did not survive the operation as many soldiers who were treated at the Rohrbach farm uh, met the same fate. This gentleman survived. This is Richard Jobes. He was a corporal in the 16th Connecticut. Uh, again, he was uh, among the soldiers who were fighting in the 40 acre cornfield. Uh, 16th Connecticut, again, was a, this was their first battle of the Civil War. And uh, I ended up, uh, when we lived in Connecticut, Jake got to know one of Richard's descendants who uh, helped me tell his story in, in uh, my first book, Connecticut Yankees at Antietam. Uh, Richard's in the cornfield, it's head high corn. Many of his comrades are scared out of their minds. Uh, he's standing looking at his Captain Samuel Brown. Uh, and Captain Samuel Brown, Jake had these huge mutton chops. Uh, I wish I could do that. You could probably do that. He had these huge mutton chops. Richard uh, Jobs ends up looking at Samuel Brown in the, in the maelstrom of, of this battle and watches him turn white as a uh, artillery fire or canister or whatever goes zipping past him. Uh, Samuel Brown ends up getting riddled with uh, gunfire. He ends up dying there. Richard Jobes is wounded in the arm. Uh, he staggers or somehow walks back to the Henry Roebuck farm and to the essentially an aid station hospital. He ends up having a portion of his arm amputated. Uh, the, the surgery uh, uh, apparently was bungled, wasn't done properly, which is, you know, in the chaos that took place that day, probably not surprising. Uh, Richard ends up going back to Connecticut. Uh, he has another operation at a New Haven hospital. Uh, there was a, a major Civil War hospital there. That operation doesn't go well either. Uh, he files for a pension. And uh, I'll just read this short paragraph regarding the surgery that was performed on him both times. And it, uh, this is from his pension document. At the first amputation, a nerve was tied in with the ligatures so as to not, so as to cause the pensioner excruciating pain. And in a year afterwards, a second operation was determined uh, upon after a consultation of the post surgeons at Knight Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. And the nerve was then cut out for some distance above the point of amputation. This failed to give any relief to the pensioner. What's remarkable about Richard is he, he lived after, well after the war, became a postmaster back in Connecticut. What he used to do, Jake, is when he was in such pain, uh, he would take his arm uh, where he had the, amp the amputation portion and dip it into a well a co of cold water to dull the pain that he had from his Antietam wound. Uh, and again, there are so many stories like this, you know, soldiers died in Antietam, obviously, in the days afterward, but many, many suffered because of their wounds uh, on September 17th, 1862. Okay, uh, this is another one of those remarkable places in Antietam that not many people get to see. This is the uh, Widow Hoffman Farm. Um, this was a major hospital site after the battle, uh, during and after the Battle of Antietam. This is private property you cannot trespass. 
Uh, I have the good fortune to know the owners who are terrific people who uh, showed me around. It's, it's a remarkable place because, I mean, look, look at that farmhouse, Jake. That's, that's pretty nice. Um, they showed me all around the place. And uh, it seems like every battlefield, Jake, has a, has a Widow Smith or a Widow this or a Widow that. Um, and, and here's the, the Save Historic Antietam Foundation marker uh, along Keatesville Road, which designates, you know, this is a Civil War hospital. You can see this, this the Widow Susan Hoffman farm from the road, and you can, uh, as you go down uh, Keatesville Road, it's really a, a remarkable place. This, we think, is Widow Hoffman. Um, uh, quite beautiful. This is an Ambro type of her. And what happened on, on her property uh, during and after the battle is uh, pretty remarkable. This is the barn off to the side of, of uh, Widow Hoffman's farmhouse. In the days and weeks after the battle, hundreds of wounded lay around this farmhouse you see here. And in the interior, the, the, as you can see, the, the, uh, uh, the stone foundation dates to the, to the battle. And one of the stories that I wanted to tell Jake is that uh, of this nurse, her name is uh, Helen Gilson. She was one of the uh, most more remarkable nurses who uh, helped aid Army of the Potomac soldiers. And one of the stories that I like to tell at, at, uh, when I did my talks back in Connecticut, and maybe I'll do some of these talks down here in Tennessee, is the story of Helen Gilson. Uh, uh, she was very well thought of by the soldiers. Uh, one day as she's making her rounds, uh, uh, one, one soldier or a couple soldiers asked her to sing. And she ends up singing, uh, the, I believe it was the Star Spangled Banner. And there's an account, a, a, a newspaper reporter was there who, who witnessed this. One of the soldiers, a, a young man lay in the, I believe the barn or, or perhaps it was the house. And all these soldiers get so excited to hear this woman sing that this young man begins pounding his stump. He had his arm amputated on the wood floor. He was just so excited by this amazing scene of this woman singing to these soldiers. Uh, Helen Gilson, uh, uh, that's, that's really a, kind of a cool story. The other story I wanted to relate tied to the Hoffman Farm, and some of you may have heard this story. This is Jonathan Stowe, who was a sergeant in the 15th Massachusetts. He was wounded over in the West Woods, which if you're not familiar with the battlefield is in the general area of the Dunker Church, the iconic Dunker Church. He's wounded, uh, I believe in the leg. Um, and he was one of many soldiers I found who <laughs> kept diaries at Antietam. And he's wounded, he lay in the West Woods and he ends up writing in his diary as he lay there wounded. What a sight I've seen as the, as the battle swirls around him. Um, he ends up getting taken to the, uh, to the Hoffman farm. He has his leg amputated. Um, he was placed in the barn, which you just saw, the barn right there, next to a 18-year-old uh, Irish-born private from Grafton, Massachusetts named James Hughes. And he writes that many of the soldiers around him are are uh, begging for water, uh, horrid sights are everywhere. And James writes in his, uh, I'm sorry, Jonathan writes in his diary, there's some dozen or more stumps near me, a reference to the amputated limbs. He ends up uh, sir, uh, living until uh, early October. He sends a, a, a note to his father back in Massachusetts basically telling him to hurry here. He's, he doesn't think he's gonna make it. He ends up dying at the Hoffman farm uh, in early October, uh, 1862. Jake, this is Mariah Hall and uh, 
And I had the good fortune of several years ago getting to know the uh, her her descendants who came to her her husband after the war. She uh, I'll tell a little story here. After the war, she uh, marries a uh, man from Connecticut. Uh, he he and uh, uh, I believe he ran a factory. Uh, he's actually buried there, and I had. Uh, her descendants, Mariah, Mariah Hall's descendants end up coming to where we lived in Connecticut. And I had the great opportunity to show uh, them uh, the grave of her husband, uh, which was really cool. And they told me they had all kinds of stories about Mariah and uh, they even have, they opened up a suitcase several years ago and found the remain, uh, the, the scraps of the flag that flew over her tent in 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 Annapolis, Maryland, when she served as a nurse uh, in a hospital there. But Mariah Hall was the 23-year-old daughter of a uh, Washington lawyer. Uh, she ends up uh, early in her career as a nurse, uh, serving in the Patent Office Hospital in D.C., which. Jacob, it's still there, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually about two blocks from where I'm sitting right now. Excellent, and it's a uh, it doesn't look like it did during the war, obviously, but in the Patent Office Hospital, uh, in uh, if if you end up going to Washington and going there, keep in mind it was a, one of the many Civil War hospitals uh, in the D.C. area. Mariah hears about the Battle of Antietam. She ends up going there. Uh, she ends up. Uh, serving briefly at the Stephen Grove Farm. Uh, she ends up serving, uh, I believe, briefly at the Hoffman Farm. And then she becomes notable for her service at a hospital, the other 10 hospital in Antietam, called uh, Smoketown. And uh, Smoketown Hospital is also on Keatesville Road. It's uh, approximately, I believe, a mile and a half down Keysville Road. There's just a field there today. Um, but uh, I've been told by uh, some Washington County, Maryland, uh, a historian who I know who used to do some relic hunting back in the day. He, he's found uh, pieces of glass and, and other stuff on the site, which is now part of uh, its own by the state of Maryland, I believe. But Mariah Hall was uh, a nurse at Smoketown from roughly uh, mid-September until May 1863. The hospital didn't close until May 1863. This image is a enlargement, Jake, uh, believed to show Mariah Hall. There's, there's a, uh, I've zoomed in on it. Uh, this is believed to be Mariah Hall actually uh, uh, aiding wounded Union soldiers at the Smoketown Hospital uh, at Antietam. It's, it's a pretty remarkable image. Bob Zeller, I believe, has a, uh, who's a Center for Civil War Photography president, I believe has a, the original of this image. Um, it's really a, a, quite, a, quite an image to see. Um, but Mariah, uh, I found many accounts, Jake, of, uh, from other soldiers just uh, speaking about uh, Mariah in just glowing terms. And one of them came from a soldier in the 78th New York named Thomas Grennan, who was shot in the jaw. And I use this quote in my uh, Connecticut Yankees in Antietam book. And he said, her self-sacrifice is worthy of something more than newspaper notice. With untiring perseverance, she dealt out to the poor wounded soldier the delicacies that he could relish in which by government regulations he could not get. Such noble women as she strips the battlefield of half its terrors. Pretty good quote. Uh, and there's many, many quotes from other soldiers regarding Mariah about her service at Antietam. Just a truly remarkable nurse. And again, after uh, her service in Antietam, she ended up serving at a hospital in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, many uh, soldiers from Andersonville, after they were paroled, uh, were ended, ended up there. And, and many, of those, many of those soldiers in uh, 
after the war remarked about her remarkable service uh, in aiding the wounded. Jake, the last um, hospital site that I want to show everybody, uh, again, is this is outside the park boundaries. You can go see this today, what it looks like. It still pretty much looks like this, what you see here. Uh, this is the Otto J, uh, Dr. Otto J. Smith Farm. It's on Mansfield Road. Uh, you can drive down Mansfield Road and, and look to your, your right and you can, or, or left, depending on which way you're going. And you can see this. This is an image taken by Alexander Gardner in October 1862, showing the farm. And when you look at the image now, Jake, you're going, uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeing too much here. But when you zoom in, it's pretty, pretty neat. You can see a makeshift tent made of hay. Uh, there's the wooden, you can see the wooden, uh, uh, a piece of wood that holds that up. And soldiers were treated here uh, in the weeks and uh, I believe months after the battle. This is what that site looks like today. I took this on a, uh, when I go to Antietam, I get up super early uh, for scenes like this. Fog coming over the cornfield. Uh, the actual auto farmhouse no longer exists. Um, uh, but the rolling field, you can compare it to this image right here. You can see uh, William Frasinato, the Civil War photography uh, expert, ID this site uh, back in the late 70s, I believe. He did some remarkable work, but you can see that the, the, uh, uh, he used the, the mountains in the background as, as part of the, uh, uh, to help identify the site. Um, one of, uh, uh, one of my friends, a longtime Washington County resident, uh, uh, has told me that he used to go out here, Jake, and on certain days when the sun hit the field just right, you could see the glint of glass in the cornfield from bottles that were, that were used at this hospital on uh, Otto Smith's farm. And Otto Smith was a Southern sympathizer, by the way, uh, whose farm became a... Uh, became a hospital. Uh, and like many of these farms, uh, here's an image, Jake, of, again, this is an enlargement of one of Gardner's images. You can see a, uh, presumably a uh, emaciated looking uh, Union soldier underneath one of those uh, makeshift tents made of hay. Presumably he was being treated on that farm. Um, but uh, again, many, like these other hospitals that I've uh, talked about today, many tragedies played out there. Uh, one of, uh, a nurse named Elizabeth Harris uh, ate at the wounded here, and she had a particularly heart-rending description uh, of what she found on that site. I'm going to read this quote to you from her. Uh, she goes, many such expressions as the following have been heard from soldiers. Yes, I've struck my last blow for my country. Whether I've served my country well, others may judge. I know I love her more than life. And then she goes, uh, the lip quivered with emotion and the face was full of meaning as the soldier added, I am done with, with all this and must meet eternity. She's speaking about wounded soldiers. Uh, I thought too little of the future. I had a praying mother, oh, that I might meet her. And then she describes, uh, a really young soldier with a full round face and mild blue eyes. And she quotes the soldier as saying, hold my hand till I die. I am trying to think of my savior, but think of my mother and father, their hearts will break. And so many of those stories, Jake played out at these sites that I've, uh, these eight sites that I've described today. There are many other places like this at Antietam in the surrounding area. The Pry House were, uh, obviously was a hospital where uh, General uh, Richardson, Union General Richardson died. There are other places like this. So I encourage you, when you go to Antietam, look for the nooks and crannies. And uh, these places are really, uh, truly remarkable. Many, many stories are, are, are out there waiting to be told. 
Yeah, that was incredible, John. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on today. You, um, you I think, describe really well that, that compelling draw that uh, many of us feel to that battlefield in particular. And you drive those back roads, uh, thinking of, of uh, the road past Smoketown Hospital and um, and some of the roads near Keatesville. You drive down some of these back roads, you know, country roads uh, past these old farmhouses and you can still sense and feel that history because it has been so remarkably well preserved in the land itself. Unlike, as you mentioned earlier, many Civil War battlefields, you, you don't get that feel of what it was like to be there uh, in the 1860s. But the Antietam area, the Sharpsburg area, Keatesville, uh, these areas still have that, that pull because you can drive these back roads and it, it still looks remarkably similar to what a Civil War soldier would have seen. History is palpable. And for those of you out there who uh, are cyclists or love to ride a bike, as I do, it's tremendous, truly fabulous. So have a, a few handful of questions here. Uh, we don't have too, too uh, much longer in terms of time for, for questions. Um, I do have a tour appointment coming in here at the missing soldier's office in, uh, at 2.30. At so you can book tours to come and visit the uh, missing soldier's office, but have time to get some, to some questions. So if you do have any questions for, for John Banks, please add them to the comments section. We'll try to get to them. Um, this one going back to, uh, and I apologize, uh, Jeff Folks, not John Folks, getting my J names mixed up, I should know, I'm Jake. Um, but uh, going back to Jeff's question, he asks, uh, he says, hello, John, uh, my gr fifth great grandfather was George Line, whose farm was set up as a hospital the day before the battle and where General Mansfield was taken the morning of the battle and later died in the farmhouse. I would love to, to hear anything you may know about the Line farm. Oh man, <laughs> that was known as the uh, White House Hospital because it was painted white. Um, if you go to Antietam and go down the gravel Smoketown Road uh, towards Keatesville Road on the right, you'll see a uh, historical marker that says George Line Farm, such and such yards. The actual house exists, but it's not on that site. And this is kind of a weird story. After the war, the house, that house was uh, where General Mansfield died, uh, was, brick, was, was uh, all the wooden beams were marked with Roman numerals. It was taken apart. It was moved over to a house on a knoll on Keatesville Road. The house was brick cased and it still exists today. It's still there, um, but which is kind of cool. And I've been to that, <laughs> I've been to that house and it's, it's really neat. I know. Uh, went there and visited with a farmer. But the George Line Farm, uh, it's a neat place to see. It's private property. You can look at it from uh, smoke, uh, the Smoketown Road and see it, but the actual George Line Farmhouse is, is not there. It's somewhere else on the, uh, near the battlefield. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for asking that question. Again, apologies for getting your name wrong a little bit earlier. Uh, but thanks so much for watching with us today. And, and thanks for, for tuning in and asking that great question. It's always great. Um, I think many of us have uh, have personal connections to the Antietam battlefield. You having a great grandfather who owned property there and whose farm was used as a hospital is incredible. Um, I know myself, I have uh, an ancestor who was wounded uh, in the fighting in a Pennsylvania regiment uh, near, near uh, Burnside Bridge. Um, those personal connections are, are so powerful and help us to draw the connection to, uh, to, to these places. Um, another question here from our good friend, Dr. John Willen. John's a, a great supporter of the museum, has spoken at the museum uh, many times uh, and done one of these programs virtually as well. He uh, takes us back to the Grove Farm, which we started off the presentation with. Um, and he asks, uh, he says, I have read them when, that when President Lincoln bent down to speak with a Confederate soldier at the Grove Farm, he arose with tears in his eyes and said, when will this cruel war end? He asks, is that correct? As far as you know. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Perhaps. Uh, I do know that based on the account from the Cincinnati reporter, that was a very emotional scene. Do I know definitively if that happened? No, but I presumably it did. So. Excellent. Yeah, there's lots of lots of apocryphal Lincoln stories out there, so uh, it's good to good to take a lot of those stories with a with a grain uh, uh, with a grain of salt. Um, 
So that's our other our other question that we have. We haven't had too many questions here, but lots of people uh, tuning in. We had folks. Uh, I believe the the winner of the farthest uh, viewer today was in Kuwait. Uh, so we had someone tuning in from Kuwait watching live with us. Thank you all so much for tuning in with us. If, if you have enjoyed today's program, uh, please consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, you will be able to uh, support these programs. You'll be directly uh, helping us to do these programs to continue on with these virtual programs that we've been doing. And we intend to continue doing these regardless of uh, the pandemic uh, and, and when life eventually gets back to normal, we will continue doing these programs programs. Uh, we're able to talk live with John Banks in, uh, in Tennessee. Uh, that's our, our amazing uh, capabilities that we have technically now uh, to be able to do these programs and to broadcast live to you. Uh, and we will continue doing these programs. And you can help to support them by becoming a member or donating to the museum. You get lots of cool perks as well. You get to come and visit the museums for free uh, and, and get lots of uh, our publications as well. You get to learn more about Civil War medicine. Uh, and if you haven't yet liked and shared this video, please go up there and, and do that now. It helps more people to, sh uh, to see uh, this presentation, to join in the conversation, and to, most importantly, learn these incredible stories. Um, these stories that John told today are uh, just kind of touching the surface of what John has done in both his books and on his blog. Uh, you'll see in the comment section multiple links to a couple of blog posts uh, that John has written. Um, my personal favorite is the Mariah Hall stories. Um, some just incredibly rich detail there about a nurse and her experience during the Civil War. Uh, and it's a very cool connection to have here at the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office that just two blocks down the street at the Patent Office, what is now the Portrait Gallery, Mariah Hall was there nursing. And then in a way, her story kind of connects with Clara Barton, um, that uh, Clara Barton also goes to Antietam as does Mariah Hall. Um, so there's connections there that can be drawn. Um, but I want to thank you so much, John, for, for coming on today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this, this Zoom presentation with us. Jake, okay, it's been great. Uh, now I have to sneak that 100-pound artillery shell into my house. So, <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. That's all, we can, uh, that's all I can say at, the, at this point. Uh, and thank you out there for, for watching with us today. I hope you enjoyed the program. Uh, if you did, like I said before, become a member, become a donor like the video, share the video, uh, and we will see you next time. Uh, lots of great programs coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks. You can find those on our website, civilwarmed.org. You can also find them here on our Facebook page. Go to the events column uh, on our page, which is facebook.com slash civilwarmed. Uh, we have a great digital seminar coming up in a couple of weeks. You can learn more about that on our website as well. Uh, lots of great presentations about the Gettysburg battlefield uh, and some of the medical stories that you can find there. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in with us today. Hope you have a great weekend.